Erev Tov Rabotai, we are continuing with our Mishnah Yomi, Masechet Shabbat. We are up to Perik Yudalid, Mishnah Aleph. Today's Mishnah should be Leilun Nishmat, Neriel ben Svetlan Aranbaev, and Eliyahu ben Burcha Yisraelov, Menuchatam began Eden, Amen. This Mishnah continues the discussion of the Melechav trapping animals. It focuses on a category of creatures known as Shratzim, which will we call in English slithering animals. This includes any animal that has no legs, such as snakes or worms, or has very short legs, such as mice or crawling insects, which appear to slither along the ground, as Rashi explains in the Pasuk in Setvil uh, Bereshit, chapter 1, Pasuk 24. Now, connected to this, the Mishnah also discusses the prohibition of bruising such creatures on Shabbat. The Mishnah begins, Shemona Shratzim HaMurim BaTorah. The eight species of Shratzim mentioned in the Torah as conveying Tuma when they are dead, which in Sefer Vaikra it's brought down in chapter 11, Sukim 29 through 31. These eight Shratzim, with their common translations, are number one, Choled, weasel, number two, Achbar, mouse, number three, Tzav, a toad, number four, Anaka, a hedgehog or porcupine, number five, Koach, a type of lizard, number six, Lita'a, another type of lizard. Number seven, Chomet, snail. Number eight, Tinshemet, mole. This is the translations as brought down in the art school, elucidated. And again, the Mishnah continues. Shmona Shratzim Amurim Batorah. The eight species of Shratzim mentioned in the Torah is conveying Tuma when they are dead. Hatsadan, one who traps them on Shabbat. Vachovel Bahen, and one who bruises them on Shabbat. Hayav is liable for desecrating Shabbat. Now, as with all Melachot, one is liable for bruising only if he intended it for a constructive purpose, the Rav says, such as to feed the blood-filled flesh to his dog, as the Rambam brings down his commentary, the Rabbi Gvegor brings down. If his intent, however, was destructive, mikankel, to, uh, such as to inflict injury or pain on the animal, he is not liable, though it's surely forbidden, as the Rav says. Now, he is liable for bruising them because he has caused blood to leave its place in the flesh of the animal and collect under its skin. Extracting something natural contained within something else is a melacha. This melacha that Mepharshim explained is known as mefarek, extracting. It's a tolada, it's an offspring of threshing, dash, which is the act of extracting the grain from its husk. Alternatively, the Rav says, bruising involves the melacha of tzovea, dying, since the skin has changed color. A third opinion followed by most authorities, is that wounding or bruising is a tonada of slaughtering, shochet, taking of life. Now the part of the animal that has lost blood because of the wound is considered to have lost some of its life. As it felt, Yisrael says, however, like the art school brings down, they follow the, their commentary follows the first opinion that it's the melacha of Mefarek. Now, although the blood has not emerged from the body, it's still considered extracted since it left its original position in the flesh and will not be reabsorbed into it. But regarding other vermin and crawling creatures, meaning shratzim that do not commit to masa, for example, worms, scorpions, or snakes, according to Rashi, one who bruises them on Shabbat is exempt. Now, in these shratzim, if a bruise is formed, the body will reabsorb the blood from the bruise and no melachav extracting has occurred because the Mephoshim explain since the removal of blood is only temporary, it lacks significance. And therefore, it's not considered to have been extracted. However, in the case of the H. Shratzim that we mentioned before, one is liable for bruising since the blood is not reabsorbed by the body. Now, the reason for this distinction has to do with the sh- thickness of their skins. The H. Shratzim have a thick skin and a bruise appears only when the inner layer of the skin tears, allowing blood to collect inside the skin and be visible from the outside. This torn skin eventually ruptures completely, causing the blood to leave the body before it has a chance to be reabsorbed. The other shlatsim have a thin skin, so that a bruise is visible without the skin tearing, and therefore, if there is only a bruise mark, it means that the blood will remain within the body and eventually be be reabsorbed 
into the bloodstream. Now, even in regards to other shlatsim, one is exempt only for bruising them. One is liable, however, for inflicting a wound that caused them to bleed externally, since in this case, blood is lost permanently, as the Gemara says in Sechet Chulin on page 46b. Now again, the Mishnah continues, we said, regarding other vermin and crawling creatures that do not convey Tumah, one who bruises them on Shabbat is exempt, and if one traps them for a specific need, he is liable for desecrating Shabbat, and the Mephoshim explained, when we say specific need, it's a situation where he clearly expressed his intention to use the animal in some way, such as for medicinal purposes, but if it's not, if he traps them not for a specific need, meaning that the trapper did not express a desire to use it, rather his intention was unknown, patul is exempt because these animals are not commonly trapped for their use. And the Mephoshim explained because their skin is thin and useless, the other shiratsim were not commonly trapped for their skin or any other use. We call that their species are not commonly trapped. Therefore, we assume that the trapper's purpose was not to use the animal, but merely to be rid of it, so that he does not perform the melech- so that he did not perform the melacha for the its defined purpose. And therefore, it comes out our Mishnah follows the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, who rules that one is not liable for such an act. But in regards to the eight shratzim that we mentioned above, the trapper is liable even if his intention was unknown, because since these species were commonly trapped for the use of their thick skin, we assume that the trapper also intended it for this purpose, and therefore he has performed the melacha for its basic purpose. The Mishnah continues to discuss the melachot, the trapping and bruising with regards to wildlife and birds. Hayav of shebil shuto, wild animals and birds that are, are, are under one's control, meaning that these animals are confined in an area where they're easily accessible, such as a small yard or a house like we spoke about in chapter 13, Mishnah 5. Additionally, the Mishnah Bura brings down in chapter 316, Sivkatan 52 and 53, any animal that has been trained to return to its owner at night is considered under the control of the owner even when it's outside its property. So again, the Mishnah says, Hayav of Shibir Shuto, wild animals and birds that are under one's control, Hatsadan Patu, one who traps them is exempt because since these animals are accessible to the owner with little effort, they are considered already trapped. And therefore, any further action of taking them is not a trapping. And one who bruises them is liable for desecrating Shabbat. Because like the H. Shratzim that we mentioned, wild animals and birds also have thick skin. And that is the end of of Mishnah Aleph. We continue now with Mishnah Bet. Now that we discussed the Menachav trapping which belongs to the set of melachot whose purpose is to produce leather. The Mishnah now focuses on a rabbinic provision in Yisul de Rabbanan based on the melachah of me'abed, tanning. En osin hilemi bashabat. One may not prepare brine, meaning a large quantity of salt water, on Shabbat. Since a large quantity of salt water is usually used to pickle vegetables, the rabbis prohibited preparing it because it appears that he will be using it to pickle vegetables on Shabbat. And therefore, the very act of preparing the salt water is prohibited, even if he will not pickle with it on Shabbat. And we know pickling is rabbinically forbidden on Shabbat, because it is similar to the menacha of tanning, and as just as tanning preserves hides, pickling preserves foods, now, the menacha of tanning on a biblical level, however, does not apply to foods, since they are not pre- uh, preserved to last indefinitely like hides, but it's still a soul rabbinically, it's still rabbinically prohibited. The Mishnah continues, But he may prepare salt water, meaning a small quantity of salt water, and dip his bread into it, or add it to a cooked dish. Because since he prepared only a small amount, it's clearly evident that he intended to use it to flavor his food and not to pickle foods with it. Amar Rabbi Yossi, however, Rabbi Yossi disagrees with this distinction. But is it not brine, whether it is a lot or a little, meaning regardless of the quantity, they are both still salt water, and therefore people will assume that salt water is permitted merely because of its small amount, and they'll conclude that any forbidden Shabbat activity done in a small amount is permitted. People will think, one second, salt water is not allowed. Oh, when you do it in a small amount, it becomes allowed, and they're going to take that to every other melacha. Therefore, even the preparation of a small amount of salt water, Rabbi Yossi says, must be prohibited. Now, Rabbi Yossi holds 
that even a small amount of salt water appears to be intended for preserving since it's occasionally used for this purpose and therefore according to the perception of people the only reason to permit it is because of its small amount and they'll take that to the other melachot rather Rabbi Yossi says this is the type of salt water that is permitted for one to prepare he first adds oil to the water and then adds the salt or he first adds oil to the salt and then mixes them with water because the oil prevents the salt from mixing properly with the water, thereby weakening the strength of the salt in the mixture. Now, when the mixture is made this way, it is obvious that it will not be used for preserving food. I'm sorry, it is obvious that it will not be used for preserving food and is therefore permitted. Now, this is permitted only in the order that the Mishnah described in which the oil is added before the completion of the salt water. However, the Rav says one may not mix water with salt and then add oil because when he when he at first mixes the water and salt without oil it looks like he will be using it for preserving food that's in the world of Rabbi Yossi however the Rav does tell us when the Rabbi Yossi the Rav does not follow Rabbi Yossi and that is in Rabbi Yossi Baruch Adonai Le'olam Amen Amen